Welcome to the Ryan Research Podcast. I'm Peter Ryan. I'm joined by Emmett Penny to talk all things uh, energy, nuclear, and I think we'll cover some Irish topics as well. Yeah. Like, uh, Emmett, can you please introduce yourself? Yeah. Um, okay. So I'm Emmett Penny. Um, thank you so much for having me. This is this is really exciting. Um, let's see. I am, well, I run two podcasts. One is called Nuclear Barbarians. Um, if you're watching this on YouTube, that's my background. Uh, and one's called Exhaust. Um, and Exhaust is about why nothing feels possible. So I've got sort of the energy podcast and then the cultural podcast. And then um, I am the editor in chief of a new energy newsletter, which is about to go daily starting next month called Grid Brief. Uh, where we try to give people the best highlights from the energy sector and uh, provide a little bit of commentary so they can uh, view that stuff in context. So that's what I'm all about. I mean, there's a longer story about how I got here. I don't know if you want to get into that, but it's your podcast. You let me know. Yeah, yeah. I think I think we're free to roam a little bit. Um, you seem like uh, we're after some, you know, answers to questions and um We'll, we'll see where we head. So, yeah, I think um, your whole brand is nuclear barbarians. I'd be interested to know, like, why, you know, obviously I get sort of the nuclear part, but like, why is the barbarians? Uh, <laughs> yeah, totally. Um, you know, <clears throat> I think part of it was that uh, for a while I worked for Michael Schellenberger over at Environmental Progress, and I helped him with both of his books, um, Apocalypse Never in San Francisco. And one of the things that I realized there is that uh, the nuclear industry won't even stand up for itself in America. Um, it's pretty cowed. Uh, I mean, having a nuclear plant is sort of like having a car right? Where it's good to have it in case you need it, but you can also sell it if you need to. And so that's nice too. Um, and if you need to scrap it for parts, that's also all right. So it's also become something of a decommissioning industry. And when I was thinking about what I wanted to do after I stopped working for Michael, he and I had a lot of talks about it. And one of the things that I wanted to sort of bring into the nuclear space was to through some sort of branding highlight like how outside the cathedral you feel as somebody who wants and is trying to get nuclear built in America. You know, it's hard to capture like just how big the forces against it are. And this thing started to happen as well on Twitter, whereas if you were like, oh, I'm really into nuclear or whatever, you'd be like, oh, you're just a nuke bro. And I was like, okay, I remember this from when I was like a Bernie guy. And I was like, I know how this goes. And you can never, never weasel your way out of being a Bernie bro once somebody's like called you that. So I was like, I just need to lean into it. And, you know, like I'm into like powerlifting and arm wrestling and all this stuff and like heavy metal. So I was like, I'm just going to like bring all of that into the nuclear space. Like whatever that attitude is, I don't see it anywhere. Everything else is very like highly polished with flat design stuff or whatever, which I'm not knocking. It's just not what I uh, wanted to bring. And so that's sort of why I went with that is there seemed to be um, a famine of like Promethean might and respect for those types of like big civic achievements. Uh, and uh, I wanted to bring some of that in there too. So that was sort of the vision um, that I went with. Interesting. Yeah, the, the, you, you don't really hear the word Promethean often in sort of energy infrastructure discussions. Uh, so I like that's, that's where your mindset is coming from. And so then talking about the origin of why you came into energy and everything, I, I took a listen to, you know, I went through your podcast and you mentioned that you were a Bernie bro and uh, I found it uh, cool how you described your journey from that space and sort of looking for answers, uh, feeling sort of um, sort of disjointed about like what was happening and there were sort of missed signals. And then you were at um, this pipeline camp in the desert. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that was a super interesting story. So if you want to give that as like your yeah, Promethean I, origin. Totally. I started to have my, like probably the first questions about energy um, 
way before I met Michael Schellenberger, way before I started reading people like Lee Phillips, way before, like when Exhaust, that podcast launched, like it launched during COVID. So we were like doing deep dives into like supply chain problems and like why we couldn't build anything anymore and like deep histories of like just in time production and stuff like that. Like that's where we were really looking at in that podcast at the beginning. And so before I had any of those questions, I was in grad school out in Santa Fe and there was this dude, um, Jay, and Jay uh, was a vet who had had a really rough time um, in special forces and came back uh, really radicalized from that experience. And he and I linked up because I was like a real heavy lefty at the time um, at St. John's College in Santa Fe. I had a feeling. I, I just, I don't know why. I had a feeling it was St. John's. Yeah. Um, and a very unique vibe they got. <laughs> it's true. Um, and around that time, uh, Standing Rock was happening. And then, and he was going up like every weekend. You know, he was taking his car, bringing gear, you know, whatever. And then he came back, Standing Rock was over and our spring break was coming up and he was like, there's another pipeline thing, an indigenous camp out near Marfa, Texas. Do you want to go for a week? And I had just, I was just starting to get published at the time, like very small pieces. And I was like, well, I'll go and maybe I'll report on it. And I went out there and within like day one, I was like, I can't report on this because I don't know how to have any distance on it. And like, I'm not just going to cheerlead um, because I also, I was starting to realize that I really didn't understand the issue. Um, and I was like, those people there had like rap sheets and I didn't want to like <laughs> accidentally like snitch on somebody, <laughs> you know, like make their lives worse, you know, um, because something happened where somebody ended up lock boxed to a bulldozer near the trans Pecos pipeline. Um, and I was there to see uh them lot box there and i was like there's already legal stuff happening and i want distance from that but i remember there was this moment where i was talking to a guy there we were having cigarettes and <sighs> some dude had come out of nowhere with a car full of stuff you know it was awesome it was so kind of it it was like supplies it was meat it was all this and as we're like loading it into our like freezer and all of that this guy looks out at the horizon and he's like you know if only people knew they could live like this the world would be such a better place i remember just thinking like i started like doing the math in my head so i was like okay so like this guy brought us the supplies we're loading in through facebook which is like this international heavy infrastructure fiber optic like project you know um uses a lot of energy probably uses a lot of fossil fuel which is the thing we're protesting here this trans pecos pipeline and i was like and the guy drove here in a car that runs on gas and then all of these things were kept that he got us in supermarkets that also need a lot of energy and i started to like walk it back and i was like wait live like how like, because all of this rests on this modern world that we're protesting. And that's when I really knew I wasn't going to write the piece because that was like a level of tension and inner conflict. Like, I couldn't really deal with, you know, at the time. It just said, like, I remember, like, my stomach getting, like, really sour after that because I was like, I don't know what we're doing out here. You know, but I wanted to be like down for the cause. Like I met people from tribes from all over North America who've been brutally treated by their governments, either the Canadian or the US, you know, and I wanted to be in solidarity with them. But at the same time, what was happening out there, first of all, it was a foregone conclusion that pipeline was going to get built. But whatever the vision was beyond having this small protest camp with its teepee set up and stuff like that, I was like, there's nothing that happens after this. Like mm -hmm. already the problem as, is so much bigger than whatever this is that this can't address it. And that asymmetry alone is giving me big, big questions about how the world is actually materially structured. 
that I didn't have the answers to. So that's what happened to me out there. Like that's when I really started to ask questions. So you're asking questions, you're in this moment of, uh, there's probably a more philosophical term for it, but you know, you're, you're basically in a way free. Like you, you had sort of a, an existing paradigm you were living in. Mm -hmm. and something happened that enabled you to actually say like, okay, I'm questioning and I'm looking at the places and I'm, I'm actually free to find alternative theories to these problems. So then where do you go next? Yeah, so I wasn't quite ready to embrace that freedom. Um, you, you know, felt the, you felt I, but I, I just felt really uncomfortable. Yeah. But I also didn't know what the off ramps were. You know, um, I had been radicalized not in grad school, but before that, I was working dead end jobs in Northern Florida for like minimum wage. Like that's what radicalized me. It's like doing that after college, and like having friends who'd like been in prison and like seeing what their their lives were like and like hanging out with people like that at Whataburger at 3 a.m., mm -hmm. you know? So um, I was like, what's the alternative? Like the idea that there was gonna be alternative to the way left and socialist politics were being handed to me seemed like so beyond the pale at that time because I had so internalized it as the solutions to what I saw my problems as when I was really like living near the poverty line in Florida, mm -hmm. that it took a lot, like years of dislodging, right? Because whatever the left is now, it's mostly a debate society. It's not really like a political- being generous. Yeah. Well, I say that because there is a, and you know, I've worked for NGOs. It, there is, is a feedback loop that happens there and it can be impediments to certain things. So it's really good at creating obstacles to politics, not the best at having an actionable politics in and of itself, especially post Bernie. Like that's just kind of over now, you know, but anyway, like what happens is I'm still like, I'm basically like a Chapo head at this point, mm -hmm. you know, and I write sort of something in the vernacular of the dirtbag left thing. And it's an article I'm still proud of. Um, it's called Lecture Porn, The Vulgar Art of Liberal Narcissism. Mm -hmm. And it comes out in Paste Magazine. And I get a DM on Twitter from this guy with a pretty big account named Michael Schellenberger. And he's like, what are you up to right now? And I was like, like right now, right now? Or like generally? And he's like, like within 15 minutes. Mm -hmm. And I was so broke at the time. My phone had just shattered and I didn't have any money to replace it. So I gave him the number for the bookstore I worked at in Santa Fe and went to the back and pretended to take an order. And he asked me, he was like, what are you interested in? And I would give this long philosophical answer about like the need for political agonism and all of these things. And he just said, yeah, I'm not interested in that. Um, he's like, what do you think about nuclear energy? I was like, I don't know, it's bad. That was the first thing I said to him. And he was like, okay, well, you seem like a smart guy. He's like, I can tell you're on the left. He's like, why don't you read this guy Lee Phillips book? book is called um, Austerity, Ecology, and the Collapse Porn Addicts. Um, he's like, why don't you check that out? And then uh, fly out. He's like, I'll pay for your flight out to Berkeley and come hang out at my think tank for a week and just see what's up. And like, maybe we'll do some work together. And I was like, okay. So I read Lee's book, um, which came out on Zero Books. And it was like my first introduction to like a Promethean perspective from left or whatever we want to call it, where the answer being supplied wasn't we need to restrict human consumption. We need to curtail the development of society in order to fit in with the like biological patterns of the earth or whatever. It was like, there are practical industrial things we can do to improve the human condition on this planet and we can do them. And yes, climate change is real, but the answer to whatever that is, is not austerity. You know, nuclear, obviously, because it's so energy dense and it's clean, features heavily in Lee's vision of the future. And that book had a huge impact on me. Um, and then I went to the DSA convention in Chicago in like 2017, I want to say. I was a delegate. And I remember going to the eco-socialist meeting and everybody there was just like we need to get rid of nuclear and build solar and wind <laughs> like just no dissent like that's what was up 
And I didn't have the chops to be like, uh, what about this other thing? Because I was like so overwhelmed by how like not a debate it was um, that I was like, this is weird. And I remember I actually re- reached out to Lee Phillips at the time because I had like messaged him being like, hey, I liked your book. And I was just like, dude, I just had this crazy experience at the like fucking national convention. Like what's going on? And he was like, oh yeah, expect way more of that. <laughs> um, and then I immediately flew to Berkeley um slept on a friend's couch and had these very patient engineers and like statisticians like walk me through like just the brass tacks of what actually decarbonizes a little bit of how energy systems work and I was like wow I'm convinced like nuclear is sort of it and then I didn't work for Michael (laughs) I went back to my bookstore job none of that happened I didn't link up with him until a couple years later under surprising circumstances for us both and I ended up uh, uh, helping him with his books, like I said, but that's when I really started to dislodge is when I was like, okay, there's like a specific thing I can point to that's wrong here. Mm -hmm. And like, everyone's advocating for the incorrect thing. Not everyone that's not being generous, but most people are, and that's a big problem. And then it was really over the course of like watching the second Bernie run, reading people like Michael Lind, um, listening to actually listening to perspectives outside of my own bubble, mm-hmm. because like when you get in, interested in stuff like energy, you stop being super partisan because there are so many people of so many different ideological persuasions that already exist in the industry. Yeah. And they're also doing something practical. So they're like, this has to keep going. Yeah. You know, like the, these are necessary goods for society. We have a vested interest in maintaining what these are, um, whether it's gas plants, nuke plants, whatever. Um, and, and that's what really started to like open my mind to, you know, like what has happened with modernity? Like, was the industrial revolution real? Or is that just shorthand for something that actually took place over decades and centuries, not years and decades? you know, questions like that. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, that's, that's fascinating going through that whole arc that you had to get to this point. Um, so yeah, so where do you think this animus against nuclear on the left uh, comes from largely? Because it's sort of, there's sort of an obvious reaction of Fukushima, Chernobyl, yeah. catastrophe stuff associated, but I mean, any inspection of what those disasters were and then what sort of the like holistic picture of global nuclear looks like, um, I mean, it's, it's much safer um, than sort of those reactions would, would make you think. So why do you think the left has mm-hmm. that antagonism? Yeah, I think that's a great question. I've actually thought about it a lot. I have a piece coming out in American Affairs this summer that actually goes into some of the set length. So I'm glad you asked because it's going to be one of my first time sort of giving a new answer to this question. And the first thing I'm going to say is that I don't think it's entirely the left's fault Mm -hmm. and that um, I have learned how mismanaged the nuclear industry has been in this country. So to give them, uh, to take a little bit of the burden off them, I want to talk about like the managerial, managerial hubris of the Atomic Energy Commission and the big investor owned utilities in the post-war era. So, you know, uh, we get civilian nuclear outside out from the Manhattan Project. And already when the Atomic Energy Commission gets formed, it's a conflict of interest. You can't really promote and regulate something at the same time. And that's exactly what uh, their charter was. Uh, so a big problem there. Um, and you, it also sort of inherited a lot of government secrecy. Um, it didn't a lot of the early chairmen didn't, even if they were new dealers like David Lilienthal, didn't really feel the need to like make things clear to the public. Like when the Atomic Energy Act got passed, most senators didn't even know what it was, you know? So why does this one become- One big sauna, right? What? One big sauna. Yeah, it's one big sauna, man. It's one big sauna, you know? Uh, what's that thing? I can't stand Ed Markey, but he always says nuclear is an expensive way to boil water. Yes, <laughs> you know, um, but uh, um, so 
shipping port is our first like real plant that works. There's one that melts down in 55. The AEC covers that up, does not tell the public. Of course, it leaks. That damages the reputation. And then a few years into the 50s, uh, the Bikini Island moment happens. And Louis Strauss, the guy who infamously ate his own words when he said nuclear energy will give us electricity that's too cheap to meter, um, basically said, yeah, not a big deal. The radiation isn't harmful. Basically, just shut up and don't worry about it. Like, why are you bothering me with this question? A bunch of geneticists were like, that's just not true, man. And rightly, they fought their way onto the AEC um, and adopted this thing called linear no threshold. Linear no threshold is created by this guy, Herman uh, Muller, who was a eugenicist socialist. And his idea about radiation exposure was that um, any amount for any duration at any like volume was potentially dangerous. And the guy, and then and the AEC just adopted that as a standard. Now, why is that a problem? Well, A, that's a highly sensitive metric and doesn't really make a lot of sense. Muller also, he won the Nobel Prize for that and suppressed scientists who he knew of that had actually debunked his findings. Now, this is where it gets really, really frustrating. And I start to lose my temper a little bit because these guys were basically so arrogant that they were like, you know, we'll never, it's a one in a billion chance we're ever going to have a real accident. So like, who cares what you use to measure it? Who cares? We're so great. That's never going to happen. So you fast forward to 1979, 12 days after the movie, The China Syndrome comes out, which is about a horrific nuclear meltdown. It's like sort of impossible to have happen the way they outline it in the film, starring Jane Fonda, an anti-nuclear environmentalist. Uh, and 12 days after that, we have a big industrial accident at Three Mile Island. Now, no one gets hurt, but we have to remember that the Atomic Energy Commission, which becomes the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, adopted the most sensitive way to think about radiation exposure while saying it's a one in a billion chance that anything's going to go wrong. And this happens in the midst of an energy crisis where utilities in a bandwagon effect build a bunch of nuclear we're driving up people's utility bills for plants that were never coming online. So it is like the perfect storm for public resentment to happen. Now, the left, the environmental movement, as it comes to be, um, this is in the moment where the left is starting to decouple from the labor movement in America. Most unions are patriotic. Most unions are like, insanely anti-communist at that point. A couple of red scares have really brutalized the left. Um, and the revelations about the realities of Stalinism had also done serious damage to it. Now, through the anti-war movement, you have all of these young people and a lot of them college kids coming into left ideas, but they don't have the same allegiance to labor anymore. And they don't want to have to figure out how to convince their conservative father in the suburbs that communism's really for him. You know, so you can't really blame them in some ways, right? Like that seems like a difficult task. Like if you're like, I'm a Marxist, so my core constituency is the we're in like industrial working class in America. And all those guys like hate me, you know, and don't want to listen to anything I say and are antagonistic to me, that puts you in a problem. So they start looking for ready-made revolutionaries and that spawns movements that do have like good, like I don't want to poo-poo what comes out of all of these movements, right? Whether it's gay liberation or what have you, but they're not socialist labor movements. And that's an important distinction to make. One of those sort of like causes that creates the new social movements is environmental environmentalism. But environmentalism is basically a eugenics movement. And people forget this because climate change has really allowed them to sort of whitewash that element of their past. They haven't had to like atone for Margaret Sanger the way Planned Parenthood has, you know? But there are guys like Paul Ehrlich who are drafting off of late 40s eugenicist writers who um, in 68 writes the population bomb 
to create the comprehensive envir environmental vision that he sees as absent from the anti-DDT movement that is birthed by Rachel Carson's 1962 book, uh, Silent Spring. Now, that vision has a logic that goes like this. It's similar to climate change. Like if the human population keeps going up, we're gonna run out of resources and it will be apocalyptic. The only way to make sure that that doesn't happen is to enforce energy austerity because that will curtail industrial development and force down population levels. And that will stop environmental degradation. So that is the post-war vision of uh, this. I found this great quote from this lefty journalist at the time who was looking back on this moment in the 80s. And he was basically like, I cannot believe that one of the most powerful anti-war movements this country has ever seen turned around after like, you know, scaring the hell out of LBJ and all of this stuff and was like, people are pollution, <laughs> you know? Like that is staggering to see happen. And part of that's because of that delinking from labor and the left, you know, because now it's environmentalists fighting labor unions to get the Indian point plant built. Because what they're scared of is they're scared of the abundance of energy that nuclear supplies. We have to remember that, you know, the government and big utilities weren't obviously the favorites of radicals who wanted to take on the man, especially if they were young. So that's an important element here too. You know, some of it's Oedipal, Bill Ayers of the Weather Underground. I think his father helped build the nuclear industry in Illinois. No, it's, <laughs> it's a, so there's like always there's like that, a, right? There's a connection there. There's, there's something going on. There's history rhyming. Yeah, exactly. So, so that's how the left ends up adopting this posture of we don't like nuclear energy. There's also a big conflation of civilian nuclear with nuclear weapons. And a lot of that comes out of the matriculation of the anti-war movement into the environmental movement um, is that conflation and it works to their advantage. So all of these people like Amory Lovins, who's like the really the first guy to be like, we're going to do all renewables, like that's something we can do. Actually, it's kind of like we can do coal and renewables, but that's another story. Um, uh, he's waiting in the wings with a very popular and infamous piece he writes called Energy Strategy, The Road Not Taken um, in the mid-70s. Uh, and there are all of these people who are even the heads of the TVA or whatever that do a pivot in the 70s away from energy abundance towards energy conservation and austerity. And so it's not just the left, there's actually sort of a unanimous like about face about the growth ideology, which was self-consciously peddled by CEOs at, you know, General Electric, Ford, you know, General Motors and the major utilities because it served them well to make sure you bought all sorts of electric appliances because then your demand went up and they could build another big power plant and drive down the price of electricity and secure their guaranteed profits as a regulated monopoly. And that worked for a while, like from I think the early 50s to the late 60s or something like that, demand for electricity grew at a rate of 7% a year. I mean, that's amazing. You know, so no wonder why you were just like, I can't wait for nuclear to come back on, you know. Um, part of it's also that Westinghouse and GE got overburdened and they just could not build the compressor parts fast enough to get those plants out on time because it was a new technology. Mm -hmm. So anyway, that's where the left ended up on the wrong side of nuclear. And that's exactly the moment when these NGOs start to balloon and become a major problem. They're, I think they're just generally a problem for... Um, American politics, uh, I read in the most recent, I think, issue of Jacobin, they had this two pages of just graphs on how much that sector of the economy has taken in. And charitable organizations, tax-exempt charitable organizations in America have something like four, over four nearing $5 trillion in assets, which is 25% of our GDP. I mean, that's crazy, you know? Yeah. So there's a lot of these people that come up in these no, new social movements in the new left that then um, 
end up in institutions and positions of power. You know, and, and so that's that's where we are, right? They they go from fighting to man to becoming the man, and this is the moment we're in. You know, and a lot of the stuff that happens in the 70s was just like that became gospel for a while about energy conservation. One of the few people that really, really pushed back on it publicly was Dick Cheney. He hated that ideology. He was like, that's stupid. <laughs> He's like, that's not how you make an economy grow. Uh, he was like, that's not a powerful energy independent America. He was like, that's all that Jimmy Carter bullshit and I don't want to hear it. Yeah, yeah, there's, um, I, th I believe there's there's a scene in, in Vice, the, the recent biopic about Jay that came out where um, it's the time period where he's in government and Reagan just got in power and they're, they're like have this montage of them taking the solar panels off the White House. <laughs> yeah, 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 I forgot about that scene. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, you have to remember like guys like Jerry Brown too, totally adopted this despite the fact that his family had deep ties to the oil industry. Yeah. You know, so like it's- Well, there's, a, there's, there's an NGO, I believe, um, the Friends of Earth Society. Oh yeah. Their, I mean, their foundation is like an oil tycoon, like created this thing. Yeah, I um, mean, yeah. E.F. Schumacher, who wrote Small is Beautiful, was a coal consultant. Amory yeah. Levins consulted for the coal, coal industry for a long time. And I think even did work in like ONG area up until the early 2000s, you know? So this is, yeah. th we're at the level of institutional path dependency now, is what I'm trying to say, at a deep, like cultural and policy level, that's how we've ended up here. Yeah, so, you know, basically we have this confluence of uh, leftists coming around this nucleus of ideology that basically human beings are parasitic. Um, mm -hmm. There needs to be mitigations on how much humanity sort of takes out of the earth and hauls it out. Mm -hmm. um, and so we have to implement energy austerity. And then, you know, ever since that period of the 70s into the 80s, 90s, 2000s, um, we've had different variations of it. Obviously, like now, it, like everything green and leftist is about climate change and mm -hmm. threats that are coming from that and, and the narratives that get, that get woven into uh, this agenda. What I find interesting as well is as you describe this disconnection between the leftist movement and labor and it's like the leftists and their father who works probably in the plant or the factory mm -hmm. um what you also have as as the other imaginary friend of leftists which is like there's the labor you know proletariat mm -hmm. and then there's the developing world um yeah the archetype and what i find interesting about the developing world is i mean there is no patience for this type of talk for the developed yeah. world to talk down to them and say, oh, no, 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 you know how we develop? We have air conditioning and refrigerators and all this stuff. You guys can't do that. So like, where, where do you stand on sort of this dichotomy between the developed oh. world is all about as much energy as much as possible and they're not stopping for anyone? Yeah, I mean, you know, maybe this is just, you know, as we might get into the Irish stuff, as you said, you know, I'm yeah. named after an Irish revolutionary and my family was ah. like, Irish Republicans, pretty hardcore. And so when I see people talking about like formerly colonized countries mm -hmm. that way, I really bring, reach my hackles up. I mean, first of all, just the audacity and condescension to say that to people who were brutalized for the benefit of those who live in the developed world is just, I, it's one of those like, have you no shame moments. I know that that doesn't really work. It's something to say to people, but it still inspires that reaction in me. Um, and look, like they need, I'm an energy maximalist. They have a right to develop mm -hmm. and the developed world can either continue to be an impediment to their prosperity or it can figure out how to collaborate to enhance it. And those are the two roads. And I'm very much on the enhanced road. I don't think coal's going anywhere for a really long time because the developing world needs to develop, but I do think there's huge opportunity to figure out how to build a bunch of nuclear, mm -hmm. you know, and to, how to do those types of deals, et cetera, et cetera. Like 
I'm not a big, like, I don't know tons about foreign relations. I could just say like on a, fir- on a first principles level, I am against trying to enforce the renewables only vision on the developed world because you cannot leapfrog developmentally. You cannot just say, we're gonna go from high entropy energy, right? Inconsistent grid, all of that stuff to a greener, insanely high entropy energy, which is the sun and the wind because it's intermittent and I'm gonna develop. That's just not gonna happen. And if you try to force people to do that, what you're doing is you are forcing them into poverty. And that's why it's really disturbing to me that the solution for climate change for climate change is actually for these people, a zombie like eugenicist idea of keeping people in poverty. Like that's the real darkness there. I don't think everybody in the green movement like thinks that way, by the way, especially not the young kids that are coming in that are really worried about climate. It's just like the tools right at hand. They're like, oh yeah, wind and solar. Cause no one's telling them any different, you know? Although I I will say, like I think, like there's levels, like it's a multi-level marketing scam. For, sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. There's some true believers, right? Like. <laughs> well, well, I, I'll say I would say more so cynicism. I would I would yeah. say that I mean there's there are definitely ideologies that are put into the world in order to sell an imperial vision, um, mm-hmm. and that that is a veiled imperial vision. And so when I see people at the highest places of society in the developed world and they're articulating. Mm-hmm. Um, these types of policies for the develop, uh, developing world, when I start to look at that, I say there's something else going on here. They're, what they're really trying to do is keep these countries dependent and weak. And it's, and it's the same common thread that runs through uh, other narratives yep. uh, that you could talk about with the IMF, with mm-hmm. foreign finance, um, with you know, free trade import dependencies, all these sorts of things. Mm-hmm. And so that's, that's where you start looking at some of these energy discussions. You say, is this really about, you know, saving the earth and all these sorts of things? Or is this about making sure other places around the world stay within their peripheral status and dependent on the core and the core can keep extracting from them? No, and I think a great place we can look for that is South Africa right now. For the longest time, Germany was saying, you know, South Africa, you don't really need those coal plants or that one nuclear plant you have. What you do need is a lot of the wind that we have built. You need a lot of German wind turbines. Don't you want to join the green movement? And now, where are we? Germany is like, how much coal can you sell us? I will give you all of our firstborn children so that we can keep our lights on this winter for that. What, how much coal do you have? You know, And that's where we are because that's sort of the the delusion of the all renewables movement worked like so many things when everybody thought that natural gas was gonna stay cheap forever. Mm-hmm. I don't know a time where that has ever been true for the oil and gas world. Mm-hmm. Tends to be cyclical. Mm-hmm. And now everybody's gotta pay the piper. You know, So I feel bad for workaday Germans who are just trying to get through their lives. I have zero pity for their leaders. Yeah. I have zero pity. I'm like, hey, you got yourself into this mess. You know, you listen to, guess who consulted on the energy vendor? Amory Lovins. Okay. <laughs> like like I was talking about earlier. Yeah. <laughs> that's, part, that's part of his vision. So they got yeah. exactly what they asked for, you know? And that's exactly why I can't, I won't put up with that nonsense. Um, that you're right, is about subjugating, continue, keeping the developed world and continued subjugation through energy needs. And that's exactly what all of that ESG stuff is out there it's exactly what all of that ngo stuff is you know um with energy it's all bullshit you know they're like no you don't need like liquid natural gas containers or you don't need propane tanks or whatever just burn wood it's more organic and natural it's like that's the most carbon intensive thing you could do oh yeah burn wood. I mean, that, that is that is crazy to talk yeah about biomass and it's like that's that's true biomass is like such a huge con <laughs> yeah i mean that i was actually one of the most um revelatory moments that i came to understanding the environment better um mm-hmm. and more through a green lens uh was i came a, I became aware of ozzy zayner you know through his documentary plants of humans and then i read his book green illusions um and i started to dig into his perspective 
And uh, one of his main critiques is that there is a serious issue when it comes to like setting up wind or setting up um, solar is that these things are like great marketing at, at the front end. And then they probably don't work at the tail end and they collapse, there's maintenance problems. And what ends up happening to fulfill the promises of renewable biomass becomes sort of this like last ditch thing to mm -hmm. make sure that percentage wise you're like sustaining that. But what ends up happening, you're just clearing forest after forest um, uh, to just burn. And it's like, it's, it's insane that suddenly the green movement is about burning forests. I think there's also just a lot of, from my experience, and also as somebody who is, I had all of the received wisdom of the green stuff, yeah. you know, before I started looking at energy. So I can say that there's just not a lot of engineering discipline. Mm -hmm. Our schools aren't really good at teaching energy. Mm -hmm. You know, so there, there's a lot of that too. I talk about this all the time. I say, you know, my mom, her father, eighth grade education, worked on the GM line, worked his way up to management, supported a wife and four kids on one salary, owned a home. And my mom grew up in Detroit. And what was their science unit in eighth grade? It was the internal combustion engine. Because if you live in Detroit, the motor city, you need to know how an engine works. Yeah. You know, there's a sort of, we've lost that as we've lost manufacturing as well. I think that's also part of why it's very easy to have all this Fugazi paper stuff happening uh, because nobody really does anything real. I don't want to say that like no one does anything real. We've got great people in the energy sector. There are manufacturing jobs in this country. We should be proud of them. I think we should expand them. Um, and I don't want to say that every single financial thing is bullshit because I think that would just be frankly ignorant. But I'm hardly alone in saying there seems to be a lot of like con jobs happening and not a lot of real jobs happening yeah well i'll say it for you i came up in the cryptocurrency space so it's like all, all the finance jobs are the <laughs> okay cool yeah well you would know better than me right like i've had to i've had to learn how to and i think this was ultimately good for me and i still have a lot of lessons to learn here yeah but because i can't i've come into the energy world um as such a newbie without you know with a humanities background not a science one or anything like that I've, I've, I'm now a little bit more humble before I'm willing to call everything bullshit until I know. Yeah, I, mean, you know? I, I think that the critical distinction is you mentioned like industrial and manufacturing a few times mm -hmm. as keywords. And um, I think that's this sort of common thread when we think more about, you know, you're really focused on energy and it's mm -hmm. a huge component, but we get into really reevaluating all of economics. And so much of like mainstream economics, neoclassical, neoliberal, whatever we want to call it, is about, you know, esoteric math equations and, mm -hmm. and sort of living up in this abstract space of uh, factor price equalization and understanding sort of how you arbitrage the best and mm -hmm. all, all this stuff. Whereas the more I've kind of dove into better understanding economics, the more I see that it's much more of this system design, almost more like ecosystem design, mm -hmm. where it's like there's all these facets you need to understand as an economist to make an economy run. And so like mm -hmm. one is monetary policy. How does money work? How does all mm -hmm. that flow through like blood? How mm -hmm. does then industrialization factor into that? So it's like, why does manufacturing create more value in a society than, you know, service-based stuff or just mm -hmm. sort of raw material extraction and agriculture. Mm -hmm. And then obviously the cor corollary of industrialization is you need a lot of energy to power those yeah. machines. And so it's like to be a successful economist in the truest sense of the word, you need to understand money industrialization and energy um, mm -hmm. in a really deep way to get all parts of the system to, to come into place. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No, I think, I think, um, I mean, that's an easy slam dunk for me. Like that's right in my wheelhouse. So it's like, yeah, I, I agree. Um, as somebody who's not an economist, I think they should know more about that. Um, and I think it's, uh, I think it's, uh, I was talking to somebody today, earlier today, um, who not because of me, but in part because of some of my work, got interested in energy and now they pursue it a lot. And he was saying, um, you know, it's, it's totally getting, learning about energy he said has totally changed my life because you can't unsee it yeah you know it's like you look at uh 
you look at fertilizer, it, like natural gas goes really high and you're like, oh no, crude's going to go high too because you need it to process yeah. crude. <laughs> and then you're like, oh no, we're going to like, there are going to be serious, there, then there are serious ramifications for ammonia and therefore fertilizers, you know? So you're going to have what I've been calling the black cascade, you know, cascading problems through each sector that arise from these big energy disruptions. And if COVID taught me anything, the major moment where I was like, oh, we're through the looking glass here was when Larry Summers was like, how come we can't make masks? And I was like, great question, Lair. Yeah. That was, <laughs> I, wonder, that was, that was, I, I wonder why, man. <laughs> yeah, and it's, and it's this deindustrialization of the West, of America. It's, mm -hmm. it's understanding um, where things are made now and... Uh, and, and again, like, like where are the masks made? I mean, not every mask that I got over the pandemic was made in China. Mm -hmm. And, you know, what's interesting going back to this like developing world dialectic um, is that whatever we want to say about climate change, everything in the West is basically irrelevant. Everything we do to diminish carbon mm -hmm. and, and focus on these renewables yeah. and solar, it makes no lick of difference unless China, India, Pakistan, so forth and so forth, these big uh, developing industrializing countries that are just gonna increase their, their production and consumption, um, unless they join the bandwagon. And after the last sort of round of climate discussions with them, I mean, they've said, we're not, I mean, we'll, we'll revisit this in 2070, I think was the-, uh, the Yeah. Yeah, I just I just wrote a thing on the resurgence of coal for this morning's newsletter. I was working on it um, yesterday, and China was like, "Yeah, we're going to keep our coal plants running." What are you crazy? Yeah, and like, what are you high? They have one grid that services their entire country. I mean, first of all, their grid balancers are gods. That's amazing. You know, huge respect uh, for that responsibility. It's a serious duty to run a piece of structure like that, but. It's the, it's the basic like free rider problem, you know, where it's like, if we decarbonize, then there's more avenues for them to expand <laughs> their emissions, you know? And I think that's where nuclear is really important here, both as an economic and diplomatic engine. Mm -hmm. yeah. Because if America wants to get into the business of churning out reactors, and I think it should for all sorts of reasons, be, that go beyond climate. But if it wants to on the world stage to have a big impact on climate change, well, then it has to compete with Russia and China. Right now, Russia is the best at doing it. Rosatom is the best nuclear manufacturer in the world, bar none. Mm -hmm. They deliver on time, like basically under budget, and they build all over. Mm -hmm. Something like 80%. I mean, who knows how it is now? I haven't looked into Rosatom post-Ukraine <laughs> and, and how it's going for them. Um, but for a while, they were doing like 80% of orders. Mm -hmm. over the globe for new nuclear or something like that. Just insane numbers, you know? So we have to get in on that. We're leaving money on the table by not. And I do think that like, if we think the a multipolar world is here, then I don't think that we can assume that there's just this American largesse that's just going to work in all cases. Mm -hmm. And I think our allies would perhaps have a right to be a little more demanding of us, especially if they're in a developing world situation, because there's not just one top dog anymore. Yeah. yeah. So nuclear could be a really mutually beneficial scenario for the world we're entering into. Not only that, it's really great for energy security. You know, I mean, we could just get, I mean, we could do domestic uranium production. We could pull from Canada. We could set up a trade agreement with them. So that's great. We could finally get rid of all the stupid stuff that Carter and Clinton did to stop us from building fast breeder reactors and refire our fuel in those if we could get around to building them. Um, and the other thing is, is in America, I don't think you're allowed to do digital displays in any nuclear plant. So it's all still knobs and buttons, which means it's air gapped from all of the cybersecurity uh, yeah. issues that we're worried about in this like incipient gray war with China and perhaps Russia. Yeah. You know, and look, like I don't have anything against the people of Russia or even like Putin or Xi, like I, I don't see the world like that, but I do see that there are just like basic realities of tensions between these countries. And this is probably how it's gonna shake out. I'm not a hawk 
I'm not an interventionist by any means, you know, um, but I think that as somebody who doesn't have a lot of power, that's what I'm seeing the world enter into. And this is a case I could make for nuclear being really good. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's a realist, um, strategic national security, um, you know, policy. It's like, you know, be defensive. It's like, it's better to, you know, control your own energy than to not and to be yeah. on global supply chain and yeah. pickle allies or even, you know, potential enemies. Mm -hmm. um, and what's interesting about that is, you know, so much of where the world was coming through industrialization in the 19th century and then into the 20th century, um, it was all of, like people were very well aware of like sort of you need independence with energy. Like mm -hmm. uh, I studied the Irish experience a lot. And one of the revolutionaries, like critical things that we'd write about is like this idea of like, hey, yeah, we could be politically independent from Britain, but we're importing their coal. Like, so that's like yeah. a huge dependency issue. And so mm -hmm. like, they don't like what we're doing. They can shut that off. Um, so, so much of what the Irish at that time were thinking about, how do we get off English coal? And so there was a number of, um, uh, you know, catalysts and, and programs to sort of get this started. And, and they, lo and behold, they settled on hydroelectric power is gonna be the solution. And mm -hmm. in the 30s, they finished this plant. It was the most advanced hydroelectric plant in the world at the time until the Hoover Dam was finished. And it supplied for like, you know, two decades, three decades, around 95% of Irish energy needs uh, until demand outstripped the supply of that one plant. So it was an amazing achievement. And it was, it was fundamentally premised on this idea of we need to get off English coal because it's a security threat. And once we have our own energy independence, then we can do a lot more. And so, and also like I mentioned, like you have these three legs of the stool, you have money, you have industrialization, you have energy, how to, be, how to run an economy. How do, you, how do you make a hydroelectric plant? You need the yeah. government to like stimulate that and make sure like there's money to, to make that happen. And so even though the government at the time in Ireland was a little bit like closer to fiscal conservatism, mm -hmm. somehow they like, made this project gel with that ideology mm -hmm. and they spent the money. It was about a fifth of uh, the, the fiscal budget and they put it together. It was an amazing yeah. achievement. Yeah. I mean, that's an amazing story. You know, I think I love that story. It's the Shannon electric electrification project. I think um, yes. I can't remember the exact name, but I thought, I think that's it. Yeah. That's an amazing story. I mean, many stories like that in the early 20th century, uh, the rural electrification processes that America undergoes during the New Deal is a huge part of that. You know, Samuel Insull, who was sort of the head honcho of um, the investor-owned regulated monopoly utility, uh, was always trying to figure out how to get into the rural sphere, but demand just could not take him there. You know, it really took FDR showing up and being like, we're going to do this. And also, I might add, a lot of senators who grew up poor and on farms and saw what it did to their mothers and their sisters and didn't want them to grow up like that. Didn't want their children to grow up like that. Didn't want the people that they knew and loved in their communities to whom they were accountable to grow up like that. So I think that that's part of it too. I mean, look, when you're super wealthy, like the US, you have a wide margin for error. Is you, so you, something can be going wrong and create big problems for you down the line. And it'll take a long time for you to notice. And I think that's where we are now, um, especially with the current administration uh, with energy policy. You know, I thank God every day now for the shale fracking revolution. Mm -hmm. I mean, how lucky are we that that happened, you know, um, to give us some energy independence. But we need to start having like a real come to Jesus moment about the importance of energy and in industry, because it's clear that America is very sophisticated in the financial sphere. And great, good for us. You know, I don't think we should poo-poo that because that's important. But like you said, that's not everything. You know, so we're gonna have to take a hard second look at some really gnarly path dependencies we've set up uh, for um, our energy and electricity markets. I mean, the whole like electricity spot market experiment that's happening, been happening in California, Texas, New England, parts of the Midwest is I think at this point, like 
the market design has such fundamental problems where it values volatility so much that it is creating physical problems for the basic operations of an electricity grid. There's no such thing as a strong country with a weak grid. Exactly. It's just a fact. So that's going to have to get fixed. I mean, I'm seeing people starting to do some serious thinking on that now. Um, and it's going to take a while for us to unwind some of this stuff or to figure out how to fix it or to come up with, you know, whatever weird public private stuff. Cause you know, America is always doing that weird, like Hamilton and Jefferson, you know, debate with itself about how it's going to do. <laughs> uh, yeah. How it's going to do whatever we're going to do, you know? Um, but that's, that's what I think is coming for us. You know, I mean, look at the, um, sort of the canary in the coal mine of Texas over the winter where they had that huge blackout and yeah, um, yeah I mean, there, was all, there was a whole variety of reasons of you know why did this happen to Texas you know at the right saying it's because of all the dumb windmills that didn't actually work they're not reliable um you had the left saying no it wasn't exactly that there were other problems and I think you can have a mix of them I, I think the obvious thing was um that I think you could point to was just like what you're sort of getting at, there's this carelessness that we take with energy. And it's what happened with, I think, most acutely with the energy grid in Texas was like, they did not plan for the black swan, like winter storm. Mm -hmm. And so like all their pipes were not properly insulated. And like, that was one of the main contributors mm -hmm. to these things blowing up. Yeah, I th so that's right. Um, we'll, we'll say this, like, yes, I, there were definitely problems with the insulation of gas pipelines. Part of that, if people really want to get into this, they should check out Meredith Angwin's book, Shorting the Grid, which goes deep into the current problems the American grid is facing. It's a fascinating book, changed my life. I love Meredith. She's great. Go find it. She just did an interview on uh, Bloomberg's okay. Odd Lots podcast. Um, so I guess people can go check that out uh, if they want to hear what she has to say about the grid and nuclear. But um, so part of it was that part of it was that we had 60 something billion dollars in wind turbines be basically useless right at the moment where you need them. Um, and uh, the other component of it is just poor market design because no one's really responsible for the grid. Yeah. That's a big problem. That's a big problem. You know, the regulated monopoly utility, you know, I've, I've, I've hard on them. They made mistakes, but they tried to be as reliable as possible because it was in their interest. And there's a lot I can forgive provided they'll actually do that. You know, um, do I understand where people who live in say Louisiana are coming from when they're like, yeah, you know, dealing with like energy or whoever sucks out here because they just throw their weight around and like, don't help us when another hurricane comes through. I'm like, yeah, that's frustrating. That sucks. It's hard to figure out how to hold a giant like that accountable. I understand. Um, so there are trade-offs and things that we need to look at that haven't gone away while we've inherited a bunch of new problems. Mm -hmm. So that's where we think we, I think we are with that. And if we want to, let's take Texas again. If we want to on shore, like reshore some stuff and build more stuff within America, Samsung puts in a semicon wafer fab in Texas, right? They lose hundreds of millions during Gary, like 300 million, just catastrophic losses, really. You don't want to experience that. Who the hell is going to keep placing industry in Texas if its grid isn't reliable? Who's going to be able to make any money with that? What are you just going to tuck away half a billion in case the lights go out? Like, that's not a business plan. Come on. Mm -hmm. You know, nobody's going to do that. They're going to look somewhere else where the labor costs are lower <laughs> and the power is cheaper and more reliable. You know, no, I'm not saying we should drive down people's wages, but I'm saying like, if you can't offer them the cheap, reliable power, you know, and whatever else, they're going to go somewhere else. Um, and American companies are going to move somewhere else. And I don't think we're going to see a day in my lifetime uh, where America is just like, we've nationalized all of this. Um, I don't even know if it would run it well if it was nationalized. Uh, but uh, so we have to think about like what's in it for American manufacturers. Why should they stay here? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's almost like um, 
there should be like a deal struck where like, you know, these big manufacturers have sort of a consortium where they like help plan like these grids on maybe like a state by state basis or something to the degree of like, you need long-term horizon here to yeah. see like what's going on and make everyone's interests align that, Hey, the collective interest in the grid working properly is in your direct interest in manufacturing properly. Um, so like, let's all get on the same terms of investment and, you know, there can be um, like management worked out of however that works. Um, but yeah, there's just, I mean, a, a lot of, a lot of the blame can be put at the feet of like, we did go through this neoliberal phase of privatization. Um, you know, there was a slew of private actors that came into the energy market. Mm -hmm. And while the logic was that this should improve it, it didn't. And I believe, uh, Robert Bryce, who was on your podcast, yeah. made sort of the nice phraseology of it where, you know, these things aren't commodities. They're not hot dogs. They are critical infrastructure. Yeah. 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 Um, I think that's, I think that's true. I mean, I love Robert. Uh, he's a, he's become a dear friend and I've learned a lot from him. Uh, just to keep plugging people I like, his podcast, Power Hungry, is also really good. You should check out his movie. It's free on YouTube. It's called The Juice. Uh, how electricity explains the world it is uh, very worth watching. Um, but yeah, uh, he and I have also started calling it the Enronification of <laughs> the energy world because he wrote the first book on Enron. Mm -hmm. um, and he was there when it was sort of falling apart. Uh, he, he watched that happen while he was working on the book, I believe. And so much of like Enron served a real need where they could create or tried to create uh, an actual like spot market for natural gas. That's really important because if you're going to do something risky like natural gas, you kind of needed to know like maybe what type of money you were going to make later, so that you could at least have like balance your books. Um, and I mean, they were also complete crooks. And as Robert likes to say, Ken Lay was a PhD in economics who couldn't read a cash flow sheet. Um, you know, all sorts of things went wrong. Um, and where am I going with this? What I'm pointing out is that there seems to be this idea that, and I, this is the theme that keeps coming up as we're talking, that you can just do the, do the market and then everything else will flow. But I think we're receiving, we're at the beginning of a really rough education that starts with COVID uh, about how that's really not the case. Yeah, uh, that, is, that is not, I mean, I, mean, I mean, we're seeing it in a, in a very real way. Um, yeah. Now with the Russian and Ukraine crisis of oh, gas prices dude. going up, and I mean the Europeans are going to have to deal with actual like um, like the Germans like like core electricity um, prices going up and austere like super austerity like I don't know what's going to happen in the short term with that in, in the medium long term um, it's just I mean it's we're back like everyone keeps saying we've returned to history Fukuyama you know proven wrong yeah yeah but like it. I mean, we're, it does really feel like, yeah, we have to start caring about the core realities of life again. Like we can't keep living in like narrative world. Like there's mm -hmm. food, energy, sanitation, you know, these are the things that actually matter in society. No, I think they are. And how we get there is one of the things that I'm really interested in, yeah. because I think that's going to be very hard fought. I think part of the reason that's going to be difficult is be frankly because of social media, not to be like one of those guys, you know, I use it all the time, but uh, I think it's clear that it does create uh, basic solidarity problems in society, just in like a mild way. Like the problem with all of the Trump coverage about like, oh, these crazy right-wingers and I've talked with Default Friend, uh, who runs um, a really great sub stack on this. Um, and she always points out, she says, look, everyone got radicalized. It wasn't just the incipient right. Because everybody just became Tumblr brained and weird and like not straightforward in their appreciation of the world. And that's a really difficult problem that I think we have that I have no idea how to fix. To be complete, absolute humility. Yeah, I mean, I, th I think, like, considering, like, we're having the chat on this podcast. Yeah, you see what I mean? <laughs> in this Twitter, you know, milieu, mm -hmm. um, I, th I think there's a way, you know, there's a singularity of, of getting Tumblr brain and then coming out the other side. Mm -hmm. um, 
but because like everyone's like post now everyone everyone was one thing now they're like post, post now they're like another i mean that's just also people entering their 30s if, we're, if i'm going to be honest like there are a lot of people from, i don't know how old you are but uh there's a lot of people that were like in my age cohort they're like oh i'm post this now i'm like no you're 34 man that's what happened you know <laughs> like you're 34 and you don't want to live in a shithole apartment and work retail anymore or service like that's what happened yeah, I did, a, I did a podcast the um, two podcasts ago, and the title was Post MMT. So yeah. you, like MMT, there's a New York Times article like three weeks ago that was written about uh, how MMT is taking a victory lap, like it's finally reached its peak. <laughs> that would be great yeah. to like, you know, okay, we're, we're over that. Now. We're over it now. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. This is the new school, man. No, I think... Um, I think there's going to be a lot of opportunity coming up, but it will be opportunity that's created out of intense pain. Yeah. And that's unfortunate, but the sooner we embrace and accept that that is, I think, at least the medium term for us, the more clear eyed America can be about what it's going to do next. Because I think we're about to enter into a, another stage of the American Republic what is difficult right now is that it's motivating ideology doesn't seem to be waiting in the wings the way it seems to have been before, which doesn't mean that it's always been rescued and safe and perfect all throughout because there are people there. What I mean is uh, we might see even more turmoil. I don't know what that will look like, but it's, this is the beginning of it being pretty uncomfortable within the flat 50. Yeah. Yeah. And um and maybe this is a good time to like maybe do a hard pivot into like sort of this other topic I wanted to cover with please like yeah Irishism yeah, uh, yeah. Um, and emphasis on like that unique word Irishism as like an ideology. <laughs> um, so like you know it's it's my personal opinion like I agree there's there's this moment of pain that's coming in America I personally think that you know America is an empire mm -hmm. um, I think it's probably been an empire longer than most you know critics of it even suggest it's been uh, I think it goes all the way back to the founding. And I think the sort of collapsing mm -hmm. ideological structures in America that are gonna cascade over the next 21st century are going to enable sort of new, new identities and, and new ways of formulating like what is American and like, mm -hmm. is, there, is there a fragmentation of America? Is there a balkanization? Um, do people think differently about, you know, sort of the more um, dia diasporic um, mm -hmm. relations that they have? And so that's where I, now arrive at this ideology of Irishism, or mm -hmm. you know, we could phrase it other ways, but I look at myself as an Irish American. I grew up on the East Coast. Um, mm -hmm. I have family that you know has been in Irish communities in the East Coast for a long time. Um, obviously, in the past hundred years, all my ancestors came from Ireland, uh, and I have a deep connection with the story, the history, the, the realities of what it means to be Irish. And, and so that's where I come into this perspective of, you know, in, in this modern world and we have ideological structures collapsing and we have to rethink our identities as we're, you know, traveling state to state, country to country, and we're like very all over the place, you know, why am I not allowed to be Irish? Mm -hmm. um, so I'd like to then turn it to you as a fellow Irish American and one that has um, an in-depth perspective about the struggle, as you mentioned, uh, what do you think about that? Yeah, I think that's really intriguing. It's one of the things that sort of drew me to you because um, I'm just going to be really, really honest. I, I'm, I find the Irishism thing attractive. I'm also deeply conflicted. Yeah. And, and let me walk through why. So, you know, my family came over pretty recently, you know, up until even in the 80s, mm -hmm. you know, I had relatives immigrating. Um, and I, so I grew up around uh, people who had seen some shit in Belfast. Um, yeah. uh, and it if, was- If you don't mind, uh, where, like, where, where did you grow up exactly again? I grew up in Chicago. Chicago, okay. Yeah. yeah. And I remember in your podcast, you mentioned you went to a Catholic school, right? Yes, yeah, that was a big part of it. Um, yeah. And the Irish identity, um, as it was handed down to me and my family, also had a lot to do with writing. Mm -hmm. So being a good writer was <laughs> in my mother's eyes and in her mother's eyes was seeing as part of it. You know, my grandmother was a very working class woman. And so when I went to study poetry, she thought the family had really made. 
you know, she's like, oh, we have a poet now. Like we've gotten to the point where we've like entered into the tradition of Irish letters, yeah, you know. Um, she was ecstatic, you know, which is great to feel as somebody who's very, was very apprehensive about uh, venturing into uh, as much of a perhaps a career killer as poetry or writing in general. Um, but I have also had this other experience where I've lived all over the country. So since leaving Illinois, I've lived in Vermont, I've lived in upstate New York, I've lived in Boston, I have lived in Northern Florida, I have lived in New Mexico, and I have lived in California. And that process was probably like the most Americanizing thing an already American can experience. Yeah. And it is very difficult for me to experience anything other than my Americanness after that experience. And so I have, of course, deep sympathies and ties to, I mean, you know, I still believe in a free United Ireland. Yeah. I still support that cause. We've talked about that. We've talked about Irish energy sovereignty, which I greatly support. Um, and yet at the same time, there's a part of me, you know, I think it was Teddy Roosevelt's thing, like no hyphenated Americans. There's a part of me that like, especially during COVID, when I started to look at the deindustrialization of the country, I got in touch with that part of myself in a much more profound way. And so I, I see like almost this half-life of what I've inherited and what's been passed down by family members who've come over and then what I have experienced as somebody in here and within America. And the thing that's amazing about America to me is that like, you know, for, I mean, for all sorts of reasons, like Malcolm X couldn't be from anywhere but America, but the X is like the most American gesture I can possibly think of. Like the break from the past, <laughs> you know, no last name, no slave owners left, just an ultimate new beginning. So what do we do with a country that revises itself over and over again like that, that has such a frustrated relationship with its own self-understanding as an empire, which is already an interesting problem. Um, and then a bunch of people like you and me who grow up with these connect connections that beyond abroad, we're far from the only ones, right? Um, so, and, and this is all to say that Perhaps you're right. This is the dawning of a new iteration of Americanness that involves people looking backwards to their own roots to figure out what it means to be where we are now, what it means for them to be where we are now. But I think that is also uh, a difficult and convoluted process that will not produce uniform results. Yeah, and I, and I, and I don't mean to say like, because you're Irish American, therefore you like have to- agree. No, of course not. I didn't take that at all. I, yeah, but, I, but just to elaborate like my point a bit, like mm -hmm. when I looked out across America, like I also have that feeling of like, you know, I am American. And like, I lived in Ireland for grad school that I recently mm -hmm. um, did. And like, I'm, I, I can certainly feel how I'm American compared to the- Yeah, American. totally. And, but when I go, when I've been through America, I kind of, I look around, I go like, well, you know what? like. I don't really identify with like some dude in the South. I don't really identify with like cowboy culture in like Montana or like in the desert. Um, like these, like these are real things. And like the histories that created these cultures, these subcultures mm -hmm. um, are real. And so if like you're an Irish dude that grew up through that journey of your family going out West and creating this ranch and like, you know, you have all these, um, attributes that come into making like the western cowboy i've been watching a lot of yellowstone too you know? oh, yeah. Like, nice, yeah. it was like i can see where that that is a very coherent and and authentic identity to have is like i'm american or you know i'm a, mm -hmm. out west american whatever you want to call it mm -hmm. when i look at that i say like cool man do your thing my family have grown up around new york city for the past hundred years um, we've had like a very close connection back to Ireland mm -hmm. and like the facilitation of culture back and forth. You know, we went to Irish schools, Irish churches. Um, you know, there, there was such of a, um, a circulation 
And it's but, roots. It's it's roots. Yeah. I mean, that's I, yeah. Yeah, but I think that that is authentic, and I don't know why that like there isn't more stuff there, and that's where like. I took my grad school journey as this experience to say, like, okay, I, I was thinking a lot of ideologies that were sort of abstracted and like free floating and they weren't grounded in anything. My priors were I was like a libertarian guy. And so, sure. So like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, um, and so like, I really, you know, I came to disagree with a lot of those theories. And I, I said like, you know what the best prescription I can give myself to like really come to terms with stuff? Let me just read a bunch of history. And so mm -hmm. I did that and I found through uh, conscious uh, decisions and just sort of like how fate laid it at my doorstep, I ended up going to Ireland for grad school. And so then all my subject matter became sort of focused, included in mm -hmm. Irish history. So as I started looking through the relationship between Irish Americans from, let's say, the 1840s when the famine struck, the first mm -hmm. big wave of immigration, all the way through, especially during the revolutionary period, um, and then basically I, mm -hmm. I peg it up to the 1960s with JFK as this culmination in Irish American culture and the full erasure of Irish sort of identity from the Irish American. Yeah, yeah victory defeats it, right? Like we have our second Irish Catholic president and who fucking cares? <laughs> yeah, I, I would also like, it, it's weird how these things come together, but it's almost like it was the last gasp of, of sort of this Irish American identity, like giving birth to Kennedy as the president Mm -hmm. But that was going on in the social engineering project of suburbanization. Totally. Of, oh, absolutely. Our infrastructure of uh, de-urbanization, like, you know, every, I mean, St. Patrick's Cathedral, come on. Like it's the biggest, one of the biggest things in, uh, in New York City, like all the way back uh, when it was first created. Mm -hmm. and, and, it was, and it was such a poke in the eye to the wasp uh, culture when they built it originally. Um, yeah. But, totally. you know, they were disintegr like this project of disintegration was sort of already in the process. And so there was two big breaks. It was that as the final break. And then when the Irish Revolution happened, there was there was one thing where it was it was finally like this struggle without a problem. Mm -hmm. So like so much of uh, not having independence in Ireland facilitated a lot of connection with Irish Americans back to the homeland. And so once that you pull that out, it's sort of like, well, why do we need to keep sending money and keep caring and, you know, supporting yeah. exiles that come here. And then what also happened was the Irish Americans supplied about a hundred million dollars in today's mm -hmm. terms to the revolution. And that money, there was a whole mess of problems that came from that where like, they didn't know if it was actually going to the war, if it was being stolen. And then the treaty happens and there's a civil war and everyone in America is like, what's going on, man? Like we, mm -hmm. we're not rich. Like we gave you money and now it's like, you're basically burning it in front of us. Um, and that was this huge, there was this huge problem in a, in a rift that was caused between Irish Americans, I believe. Yeah. And the mainland Irish. Yeah. I mean, that sounds right to me. And all sorts of stuff happens in the, you know, eighties and nineties as well. Um, when the sectarian warfare heats up again um in the era of high reaganism and uh revamping of the cold war people have a lot of mixed feelings about what revolutionary means at that point um and who's doing what so i totally i hear that i mean the thing that i'm hearing from you that i've been thinking about a lot lately as somebody who especially as somebody who grew, has grown up in the midwest mm -hmm. and has now seen both the east and west coast you know um and realized that that's like a specific thing yeah, you know, um, uh, and here's what really like flipped my wig is when I lived in Santa Fe, because I was seeing stuff that had been on what is now American soil since the Inquisitions. Mm -hmm. and I was like, "What does this mean? What does it mean for this to be forty miles away from where we figured out the uh, first atomic bomb?" Yeah. It is weird to have the oldest Catholic church in North America there and then have this like demonstration of like the highest of mechanized modernity happen nearby, you know, and for it to be this total site of the Cold War, you know. And I think 
based on all of this, what I think is going to happen, and you can see this in some of the Claremont Institute guys, like Dave Reboy, he likes to talk about an American divorce, um, you know, uh, red from blue, uh, and all of that, is I think we're going to see a return to regionalism in America. Mm -hmm. I think especially as these energy issues ramp up, um, and I think as uh, the millennial experience was one of being highly mobile after college. I think we'll see less of that. Um, and so I think, I think that's going to play uh, a factor there too. And I think that will bring with it all of the ways people experience their um, non-American roots within those contexts. And it'll be interesting to see what solidarity school out of this like i'm also thinking about um mexican americans here too like what if from canada to the southern tip of mexico there is um not like nafta again but a deepening of the trade block in the multipolar world what's that going to mean that's going to have interesting implications for a sense of americanness regionalness and then like uh immigrant ethnic identity you know and what does assimilation mean in a world where you can constantly iterate and simulate your identity online? Yes. And like that, that's, all, that's a whole other can of worms. But I think, and what's interesting is, is the factor to here. Like, I mean, our first half of this discussion was about sort of basically like the Western world's decline, like whether it's energy or it's, it's deindustrialization. Um, but I think the pains of deindustrialization and sort of the, the engine of the economy being turned off and stalled. Mm -hmm. I think, I think that's what's really starting to reveal um, these things. And like, when I look at my personal history of like, how did my, you know, great grandfather, grandfather, father, like mm -hmm. how did they decide where they lived and, and kind of moved around? I mean, it, and it's dictated by economics. And so it's like mm -hmm. before, you identified with your land and sort of your, your village. And, you know, there was all these associations and there was a real, you know, you could say positive tribalism, you know, for lack of a better word. Um, but now it's like, how do you feel any like allegiance to something that uh, was, you know, an arbitrage equation for what was the better job or you could get a better house price. And mm -hmm. it's mm -hmm. like, you know, every, everything is a commodity, your, your location and thus your identity is a commodity. So what point is there to have, um, you know, any sort of like strong faith in it? I always looked at this interesting, like through like sports teams. Um, mm -hmm. I never, I never could find myself like getting into that as a kid because I'm just like, well, what does it matter? Like, I don't get it. Like I'm, I'm in this place. I'm in that place. Like, how do I identify with the team? If like so much of it is arbitrary, it, did, it didn't make sense. Why I would be that like mm -hmm. stirred mm -hmm. up about it? But that's where I get to this other end of the spectrum. It's like, okay, the American economy is what it is. I'm thinking about things differently as like this fourth generation American. And I actually kind of compare my situation to that of, you could say, um, um, people of the Islamic culture, whether they're in America or Europe. Uh, and, it, and a lot of time, uh, it's they've, <laughs> I'm not, not going like hyperbolic with this yeah. analogy, but... Um, you know, when they look at radicals um, within the West that have an Islamic background, what they find is like, oh, it's not the first generation, like, because they're like working a job. The second mm -hmm. generation is pretty assimilated. They're pretty like, you know, mm -hmm. into the, the Western culture. But it's like this third, fourth generation. It's the rootless third. Yeah. Yeah. That is just like, for whatever reason, like they're the ones that have this gigantic break in radicalization. And you could probably chalk it up to this fact of when the first generation gets here, they're probably in some sort of ghetto. So they're like in their own culture still, there's like a colony. Mm -hmm. And so like they have a lot of, and they're probably mm -hmm. like maybe going back and forth to their home country. Like there's a lot of assimilation and um, in terms of like uh, an easy onboarding process. Then the second generation, like they probably just like, hey, we're winning, we got a decent job. Like we're living that American dream. Um, they still have, they still retain a little bit of that um, old culture and like they're feeling, you know, the gains of this whole process. Then you get to the third and fourth and what you see is like, okay, these are the ones that like probably go to college, they do grad school. Mm -hmm. They're like mm -hmm. these minorities in these dominant cultures that like 
they don't fit into well, that maybe they feel alien to. Mm -hmm. um, they're finding that maybe like, okay, now their grandfather was a, uh, I don't know, let's say like construction worker, their father was an accountant and they have to be, um, you know, an investment banker and suddenly yeah. they're a doctor. And like now, like they can't do that maybe. Maybe that's, that expectation is pretty hard, especially as a minority. Mm -hmm. So now they start to really say like, well, fuck this system. Like, I don't like it. It doesn't like me. Like I need something to hold on to. And that's where it's like, I need to return mm -hmm. to this like indigenous culture. And so that's where as like, I stand as sort of this like proponent of thinking about Irish American identity differently mm -hmm. is mm -hmm. like, why don't we have the opportunity to think about that and say, hey, why can't we return to Ireland? Or why can't we have more well why can't we simply have an ethnic identity like what well, i mean this is sort of the fiction of whiteness yeah in all sorts of ways yeah. <laughs> you know um i mean this is when you look at the debates over busing this was a huge factor in how that worked mm -hmm. is that there are a lot of like italian americans irish americans jewish americans who are like you know we're not all the same you guys realize that right <laughs> like we have our neighborhoods we have our ways of doing things we're different identities and look like i think there's a boon and burden here mm -hmm. um you can have uh a certain level of pluralism and i think at some point it becomes like a bad faith universalism i think that's what a lot of people are experiencing now and that's where that pain comes from especially for that third generation but then you can also have like out and out like sectarian struggle i don't think we're quite there yet but, you know, uh, we might have the potential to be. So how we thread this needle is, I think, really, really interesting. But the thing that I absolutely, like, am 100% there with you on is the need for more Americans to figure out what, like, a, a sense of rootedness, yeah. an anchorage in time. Exactly. We are so divorced from that that I think it creates real spiritual and psychological and social problems for us mm -hmm. and it makes it difficult for us to navigate whether individually or in our communities or at the political level or what have you what we're going to do next because it's unclear what any reference are and to bring it back to what we we're talking about before it's not just that i think i have the insight dope because i've read energy history a few times i do think there is something that happens around kennedy and around the energy crisis that ends an iteration of america that felt more tethered to the past and uh now we're in a very funky place where I think people feel incredibly adrift and don't know what to do. So I have sort of two predictions on that, maybe three. I think we'll see perhaps, you're right, more Irishism, more Italianism, more, more of these things, um, more Mexicanism uh, and, and it, those relationships to America. Uh, I think we will see more entrenched and even weirder fandom culture. Mm. Uh, as an attempt to fill that hole with um, yeah 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 and and with like you know uh basically taking the uh intellectual property valhalla that is los angeles and making it your inner life um in terms of like disney products and stuff like that um and then um i think there will be and they'll be small but it'll it'll be potent um a people who find religion I think we're going to see a lot of those th three things going forward on the cultural front. I think the cultural questions that began this decade will not be the cultural questions we're asking by the end of it. Yeah, I, th I think that's right. And, and in a way, even though the age groups differ, uh, it, it is very much like some summarized by your statement of like, no, dude, you're just 34. <laughs> yeah, so yeah, much exactly. of what all of culture is, is like, this feeling of being 34 and being like, okay, that's okay. I, I was in a band and that didn't work out. Now I have to like reorient my life or, you know, mm -hmm. think about, you know, maybe what my dad said was right. <laughs> you know, it's like, totally. maybe yeah. I should go to church. <laughs> it's all these things. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And, and, and what do I have to draw on? You know, where, 
what happened before me? I think a lot of people are hungry for those questions. Yeah. I think um, there are not a lot of people supplying them. So there's a great need for that. And I think that coupled with the return to brass tax energy stuff and in industrial stuff that we're talking about, it makes me hopeful for the types of opportunities that would be born of the pain of the present. Yeah, and, and when I also say like Irishism, like I mean a direct, um, you know, identity relationship with sort of Irish American, Irish global diaspora, anywhere there's like Irish Canadians. Oh Irish yeah, 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 of course, of course. So forth. But I also mean um, like almost like a, a greater sense of that term because I think in a way it can be almost like a universalistic <laughs> ideology um, because when I look at Ireland and when I look at, you know, whether you're on the left or the right, everything is an abstract theory. It's not grounded in anything. And so when I became acquainted more and more with Irish history, I actually found a praxis. I found something that could embody theory, found something where you could say, okay, go through the, the different deviations of Irish history because they've been fighting rebellions for a long time against a power structure. And you can see like what works, what doesn't, and you can see how people coalesced around an idea that actually uh, for all the pains that, you know, the civil war was and, you know, the unfulfilled promise of Republic and the treaty and partition mm -hmm. and everything. I think all in all, the Irish revolution was one of the most successful revolutions and, and one of the most clean in the mm -hmm. sense that um, there was an unambiguous righteousness and justice to it. And there was a unambivalent buy-in by the mass population because by 1916, there was a little bit of a minority movement of the revolutionaries. So that's where everyone says like, famously the uh, 1916 cadre was sort of like spat at as they walked through the crowds of Dublin. Um, but by 1918, when there was an election, mm -hmm. the Irish public broke and in a mass democratic move voted for Sinn Féin, the party that has been associated with the violent revolution of 1916. Yeah. And so yeah. by looking at the Irish revolution and all of Irish history, anybody in any world uh, context can take the lessons from that and apply it to their own struggle as sort of this like decolonization handbook. And as you sort of branch out around the world and do sort of a global history analysis, you actually find um, whether you're sort of in India or in other parts like mm -hmm. India, especially I've learned, had a tremendous influence from the Irish in their revolutionary struggle. And uh, yeah. one of the Irish revolutionaries, uh, Dan Breen, he wrote a book on like how to do it tactic wise. And it was banned by the British because it was so like everyone was reading it. And, and, yeah. Yeah. No, no, no. I think, I think that's true. I mean, I think what we're really talking about is we're talking about some sort of renegotiation of how we're going to achieve some sort of universal communion with each other through particular experiences. Exactly. And I think we've uh, spent the last decade as, as a millennial, I'll say this, sort of inverting that. And I think that's what a lot of the like identity reshaping online has about to do is trying to come at uh, trying to repattern the specific parts of yourself to meet this abstract ideal that exists outside of space and time. Yeah. Right. Um, and I think, I think we're going to return to that. So yeah, I mean, I'm excited, man. Like as, as brutal as things are, as confusing as things are, like you have to figure out how to be grateful for it and you got to figure out how to just embrace it. Like how to be ready. Like if, you, if, if we take what you're saying, it's true, is that this is something that can be adopted, then that's born of struggle. And so we have to walk into this that way. And, you know, that's where I have on over my shoulder there, um, the Irish revolutionary Arthur Griffith, I've seen him. And like through my, my study, my praxis, um, you know, I obviously identify with the history, the culture, but I just became so enamored with people that actually successfully conducted a revolution. Yeah, oh yeah. And, and what Arthur Griffith represents for me is, as you said, it's about this walking into the struggle as a young man, he started this like in 1898 was really when he cut his teeth and it took him to 1922. And it's amazing that in his lifetime, he, he was writing about a free Irish uh, state mm -hmm. and he's, and through just 
I mean, the guy was in poverty most of his life too, because he didn't take a cent. He was just mm -hmm. so driven by this ideal. And he had, a, I think, a very strong morality in the sense of like, he wasn't going to profit off this thing and everything was going to go into mm -hmm. um, struggle. And so he grinded for 20 years, if not longer, to get this thing off the ground, to get all of these, you know, conflicting interest mm -hmm. groups and the Irish struggle together into Sinn Féin. Mm -hmm. And he becomes the first president of a free independent Ireland. It's just like, how do you not respect the fact that this guy stuck it out and didn't give up for like 20 years? And like, that's the mentality that us as sort of people like in sort of a dissident space and trying to sort of articulate things that are outside the mainstream, I think need to like absorb and retain because um, so much of sort of what is in sort of the, like the critical um, mm -hmm. Twitter space of like, ah, like, you know, this isn't working. We don't like where things are going. Um, it's so much of that. It's so much of like that black pilling of, you know, seeing tweets and then like, you know. Yeah, nothing feels tweets. possible. Yeah. 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 Whereas yeah. like, you just gotta, you just gotta friggin', you gotta ride it out for 20 years, man. You gotta <laughs> eat shit. Yeah. I yeah. mean, I think, yeah, embrace the suck. That's where we're at, you know. Yeah. Yeah, man. Um, so to then like full circle this. Um, mm -hmm. So on sort of like Ireland as the topic, uh, can you share any insight you have into sort of the Irish energy question? Yeah. So you and I have talked about this. And for me, um, I mean, look, I'm an outsider. Yeah. Um, so let me qualify it with that. I worry that one of the things that's an obstacle for Ireland is a lack, and this is going to sound very American, but I think it's real, a lack of a can-do attitude about <laughs> industrialism. Yeah, I think, yeah. It, I think, so I think that might be part of it. I think um, this is not, uh, I, I think it's not a unique problem um, where countries that have existed as colonies emerge from that experience with a damaged national ego about what can be possible for them. Mm -hmm. So I think that that's part of a cultural question um, that I've heard from Irish people I've spoken to about it. Uh, I think that's an interesting problem. Don't know how to fix it, but it's one that they'll have to navigate. What I can say is you and I have talked about just how much offshore drilling could happen in Ireland and how frankly cool that would be because you would have energy independence. And on top of that, I know that there are uranium deposits in Ireland. Mm -hmm. So there could be a nuclear program. And because the Shannon electrification project happened there, um, I think that something really important could happen again because I do believe that Ireland will be united and free, but the terms of that freedom and that unity will be dictated by its ability to be energy sovereign. I really believe that. Yeah, yeah, and what a shame is, like I, I explained how in the 50s was when like you hit the peak of like the Shannon Hydro plant was supplying almost 95% mm -hmm. of the energy electricity needs um, that starts to change. But then like natural gas fields are found in Ireland. And then again, it's sort of like, it's starting to become energy independent with its own fuel. Mm -hmm. um, but now as we approach 2030, you know, Ireland's gonna be importing 90% of its um, energy from the yeah. UK in the North Sea and some, a little bit of Norway. And then there's, you know, more rounding errors from like, you know, maybe not anymore Russia, but other yeah. places to fi figure out some of the petrol stuff. But, um, but again, going back to like the revolutionary vision, it's sort of like, I mean, no one in the revolutionary cadre would like accept the fact that, you know, Ireland had the energy potential, but mm -hmm. they're voluntarily making themselves totally dependent on the English, you know, not just energy system, but the political will of the English to decide, you know, what happens with that energy on a bad day. Um, yeah, no, I think, and I think that's going to be a rude and difficult awakening. Um, I hope that parties like the Sinn Féin have their act together enough to realize that they'll need to get out in front of that and have a vision yeah. for what it's going to look like. Um, I've talked to people in the Irish Workers Party about it. Um, I know they're a small party, but they're also the first to embrace nuclear energy. And one thing that I've learned is studying, studying the success of the environmental movement is it is amazing what a motivated minority can do. So um, 
Yeah. Again, I think, I think there are a lot of dangers ahead. Um, when stuff starts to get like border heavy and commodities freaky in Europe, I think everyone gets a little nervous. Uh, but this is what we're entering into. So I think people are going to have to start asking those questions now. Like if there are Irish listeners, I would say like, think about that now, not tomorrow. <laughs> you know? <laughs> well, I, mean, they, I mean, it's like they, they are, I think like they're probably hitting the wall a lot faster than any of us in America will. Um, yes. Oh, yeah. yeah. Thank you to the Permian Basin. God bless it. Yeah, like <laughs> whatever is going to happen in America, like fuel wise, like who knows, like maybe we'll like get something out of Venezuela, uh, you know, Saudi Arabia, Iran, like that's sure. the talk. Maybe the political will will be there regardless of Democrat, Republican to then do domestic production again. But with the Irish, I mean, like they just put in a ban in like 2019 on all new exploration and drilling in the offshore. And like they already have a ban on fracking, um, um, yeah, because they're in the EU, right? So, yeah. So it's like, yeah. um, it, it's 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 craziness, and they think like over fifty percent of their energy is going to come from wind, and it's I mean like I don't I don't know how you're going to figure that one out if you're not if you don't have natural gas that you're producing yourself, um, and you think it's all going to come from wind, and then it's like you're going to have to then you know ask the UK to to push that forward and look they're having their own storage problems like yeah you know, I mean, they got their own their own yeah you'll get fed last <laughs> you know those are going to english homes first and not out of malice but because those are the priorities those are the incentives that's the way it's set up that's what it is like to be energy dependent exactly. no one if you are energy dependent no one thinks of you first Exactly. And the even weirder part, too, is that, like, you know, the economic growth vision of current Irish policymakers mm -hmm. is that rather than, like, you know, do anything that's, you know, real value creating GDP construction, uh, they're going to bring in multinational data centers as, like, this big, you know, this is the next, like, this yeah. is high tech. As if those won't be power hungry as hell. Yeah, it's by 2030, you're going <laughs> to absorb about 35% of Irish energy. Um, and so it becomes like, okay, well, how many people do those things employ? And like, what's the money that's sort of going back into the Irish economy from those things? And who is deciding when there's a triage moment, like who gets the energy? Like, is it the multinational data uh, companies that like need to make sure that IT is traveling through the, you know, to right, right. Because now it's a hub. It, yeah. An Irish farmer. You know, who's getting cut first? Yeah. Yeah. I think we know the answer. <laughs> the way things lie now. You know, and I yeah. think that's gonna be that's gonna be really difficult. Um, I think that problem is going to be what some of the um uh renewables only while electrifying everything, uh reality that uh, American environmentalists and basically the Democrats, because they're the big proponents of that idea they're gonna come crashing into that wall as well. Because again, these things weren't meant to power an industrial society, right? They were meant to keep people in energy poverty. They're an anti-abundant infrastructure because they're high entropy. Energy density is energy regularity. And I think that's like a back pocket meme that we gotta like march into the future with because the people who already run everything will find fantastic ways to argue for why you have to do with even less. Okay. Well, it's amazing. I was reading um, uh, some of the Irish government um, deliberations and debates, like the transcripts are online of like how um, the ban like on offshore, um, drilling exploration came to be and the arguments from from the left green side i mean are, are just like astounding because because you have not even like a right there's no like right wing in ireland um really and like from like there was this guy i forget his name but he was an independent and he was just like trying to say look i agree with all like you know we have to decarbonize and like you know climate change i agree 
but like we have to respect the numbers here like there's yeah math and like scaling down and we can't just turn these things off because there's going to be no natural gas to backfill what mm -hmm. we need in the next 20 to 30 to 50 years because we're not just going to have wind and solar do everything like there's just no way to do it yeah there is no way to do it it's their batteries aren't going to happen like none of that's going to happen um and i think uh Germany is a preview right now of what overcommitment to that idea looks like. And Germany is in a better place than most because they've got great coal plants. Yeah. So, I mean, if, if you, so if you don't have those, good luck. Good luck. <laughs> yeah. And, and so that's, that's the irony. It's, and, and, and one of the things that's like strategic about like Ireland's, you know, uh, geographic structure is, uh, that is conducive to like a green agenda is the fact that um, like we mentioned like the past historical hydro plants that Ireland yeah used. but there was this interesting project called the Spirit of Ireland that was starting to get legs um, in the 2010s and it was attracting investors it was attracting interest by government um, of all people um, this guy Eamon Ryan from the Green Party who's the Minister mm -hmm. of the Environment who led the ban on offshore uh, exploration and drilling and is telling Irish people currently dealing with high gas prices to drive slower as a solution. Oh yeah. Love and, that. Um, no, straight out of, straight out of Nixon's playbook yeah. and the independence act. Yeah. Yeah. So he's, he was actually flirting with it at one point in this period. Cause it's like, Oh great. Yeah. Renewable. Great. But for whatever reason, like that fell through and you know, we can question why exactly from a, you know, idealist standpoint and a cynical standpoint, um, but what was incredible about it was like totally innovative. Ireland has these Atlantic cliffs that are right next to this great reservoir of water, mm -hmm. uh, the ocean. And you could just do like, you could like the only way to make wind kind of really work is pumped hydro. So you yep. can have wind turbines, maybe offshore, like on the cliffs, pump uh, hydro into re reservoirs on top. Then when you need to throw that stuff down the cliffs into a turbine, and mm -hmm. now you have uh, super electricity that you could be probably a net exporter from mm -hmm. the way that this design was being set up. And it's incredible. It's like, okay, so like, what's the problem with hydro? And this even like, you know, flirted with your little wind turbine fetish. So like, why did this fall through? Mm -hmm. And why isn't there e even any discussion of hydroelectric power mm -hmm. at all? It's always wind and solar. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, and and that's. I mean, look, hydro doesn't get ESG funding in America, which is crazy. Yeah, you know, <laughs> uh, conspiracy tinfoilness about hydro, like it just. Yeah, I mean, yeah, it's a big industrial project. They don't like it, you know. I think we're seeing this in New England right now. They shut down a new point. Part of that was a nuclear plant in New York. Part of the reason why they said they could do that is like, well, look, we'll build a transmission line, basically, to. Um, Canada, and we'll get their hydro. We'll get it from Hydro Quebec. And then after Indian Point closes, the Greens turn around and say, well, we don't want a big industrial project like a big transmission line. That would just be eco-unfriendly. There's, I found one of the lawyers for no, no nukes. One of the things he said, look, he said, look, it's their job, the people who want to build things to figure out how to be balanced and weigh the scales of the environment and energy. He's like, that's not our job. Our job is to be unbalanced and to make them sacrifice. Mm -hmm. And that's how they see the world. This is an ideological conflict. Yeah, yeah. And, and you know, I, and I think there's probably a few different factions that all sort of like find mm -hmm. alliance. And when I also like specifically, when I look at hydro, I look at these things, I say, okay, you know, it's basically cement, there's some machinery, um, you know, there's a few moving parts, but it's pretty basic. And like the average lifespan of a hydro plant is about hundred years. Yeah, it's as I good mean, as maintenance. Yeah, yeah but, it's as good as the concrete you take care of. Yeah, and the like concrete yeah, and, is an industrial process that it elicits. You know, but like whatever, like it takes energy to make energy. You're never gonna get rid of that problem. You know, one yeah. of the reasons why we're not getting rid of fossil fuels for a long, long time is because we need things like concrete. Yeah. It's just the way it is, you know? And we need it for great things like hydro. Yeah. And then when I, when I start to look at like wind and solar, I'm like, 
Well, the lifespans on these things are really closer to like 10 and for being generous, 25 years, like depending on how it all shakes out. And then there's, there's a lot more maintenance and it's like, okay, well, when I think about, let's say, you know, use 10, 10 years versus hundred years. And it's like, okay, well, that's really beneficial to a global supply chain and like middlemen in between and bottlenecks mm -hmm. in the supply chain. So yep. like China is like 90% of the solar panel, like, you know, finishing process. So, you know, like there's- Yeah, and they, they have a lot from. of the minerals on lock too, yeah. Yeah, so there's a lot of minerals, but like, you know, okay, like Chile does stuff, like Congo, there's a few places that like extract raw materials, but everything then goes to China, gets finished and then gets pumped back out to the world for so mm -hmm. um, Similarly, like high- um, And it's all made it, with coal, by the way, in China. Yeah, and that's, and, and especially in the current context, um, there's going to be, they're going to be taking more Russian energy mm -hmm. and we're going to, st we're going to be doing more renewables buying from China that's using as a second Russian energy. Russian yep. energy. And so driving the demand for Russian energy. Yeah. 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 I mean, you can't make this stuff up, but I mean, like that's where we're at, man. So we got to, it's a good thing that more of us are starting to find each other. Yes, sir. So, um, so yeah, so I think that, that really takes us, that's full circle. Uh, yeah. And, uh, but yeah, this has been, this has been good. Um, I think uh, maybe the, the tagline of this episode is uh, don't go green, go emerald. <laughs> yeah, that's like, right. I love it. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. I think of like the nuclear cartoon. I think like it's more emerald colored. Than green. Yeah, no, I love it. Um, I absolutely agree. So yeah, for rating it tomorrow. Cool. Um, share any sort of projects you got coming up. Oh yeah. You can find me on Twitter at nuke barbarian. Um, and, uh, you can find my uh, newsletter at grid brief. Um, and you could sign up there as well. You can just go to gridbrief.com slash subscribe. And, uh, the nuclear barbarians podcast just shows up in the newsletter every Friday. Um, and my other podcast exhaust, you can see in my Twitter bio handle you can check that one out too if you want long form cultural problems that we look at over there so that's all my stuff cool and i'll make sure to put all the links in the show notes below and uh this has been good man i think yeah thanks so much this was a lot of fun